Okay. I'm Jocelyn Goldfine, and uh, I guess you're here for a talk about valuable constraints. Um, I retitled my slides, but it's the same talk, I promise. Um, I apologize in advance if I cough in your ears. I'm fighting about of asthma, so I'm not contagious. And I'd love to begin with a little bit of introductions. This is a big crowd, so we can't have you guys introduce yourselves individually, but I'd love to have sort of the collective introduction sort of show of hands. So how many of you folks in there are software engineers? Excellent. How many, how about um, product managers, designers, or other folks making software? How about other kinds of business roles, marketing software? Good number of you, okay. How about, is there anybody here who's not directly making product, but maybe press or finance or other kinds of, no, all right, we're all trying to make, mostly trying to make and uh, to, to build and ship software here. Excellent. Um, that is definitely the set of people to whom my talk is geared and who I hope will find it most valuable. How about company size? How many of you work in startups? How many of you work in more medium sized companies? Let's say it's sort of hundreds to low thousands of employees. All right, large companies, you're in the sort of 3,000 to 10,000 range. Okay, really big companies, you work for Microsoft, 10,000 plus. Okay. Few of you. All right, but mostly in smaller environments. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, well, let me uh, reciprocate. So I have worked at a variety of different companies um, in my time as an engineer. I started my career at a company called Trilogy, which sold uh, very expensive, very customized software to Fortune 500 enterprises. Uh, I went on to co-found a startup called Message One that was still in the enterprise space, but um, was built on a web stack. We were trying to do software as a service. Um, and then I moved from there, still staying in the enterprise space, but moving much deeper in the stack, I moved to VMware. And I spent seven years at VMware building operating systems for the data center. <clears throat> and finally, I spent the last four years at Facebook, at the opposite end of every business model I'd ever worked on before, doing um, consumer software, social software, obviously. I probably don't need to explain what Facebook is. <laughs> um, since uh, the statistics suggest that Almost everyone in this room has at least given it a try. All right, so um, you're all here because you want to experiment. That's what this conference is all about. But it can sometimes be demoralizing to get advice about experimentation that seems like it couldn't possibly work in your environment. And you know what Facebook does, Facebook is literally running A-B tests in production 24 by 7. VMware, in contrast, has a ship cycle that is roughly every two years. Um, so if we wanted to ship a new experiment to production, uh, we wouldn't get to do that very often. <coughs> um, VMware, uh, Facebook can be kind of flaky. You know, there are times when it's glitchy or doesn't quite work. Um, VMware, on the other hand, has built a reputation and a business on being absolutely rock solid, reliable, mission critical. It might surprise you to learn that these two companies both rely very heavily on experimentation to drive innovation and to drive the product release process. But the ways they go about it are really different from one another, and what would be disastrous in one environment works flawlessly in the other. So what I'm here to tell you is, no matter what environment you're in, you can experiment. But the way to experiment will depend on what product you're building. The Guggen this is a shot of the Guggenheim Museum which is widely known as one of the best examples of the architectural principle that form follows function. We don't start with a building and then decide and make a beautiful building and then decide to put a museum in it. We start knowing we want to build a museum and we design the building to fit that purpose. And so the goal of my talk is to teach you to recognize the purpose, the function of your product and how then to design an experimentation process that will work to support your product. And it's not a question of personality. It's not about the personality differences between Diane Green and Mark Zuckerberg. It is absolutely about what technology stack you run and what business you are in. So let's start with technology stack. <clears throat> your technology stack is the most fundamental thing that drives the cost of experimentation to you. Think about it. On the web, you control the servers. You can deploy whenever you want. If you want to update code, you do it. You don't have to test across eight different environments because there is only one environment, your web server. Um, and if you want to start an environment up or shut it down, you do that when you feel like it. The lower in the stack you go, 
the less you control when you deploy. And the instant you cut over from deploying on your own hardware to deploying on your user or your customer's hardware, there is a real inflection point. There is a real divide in how you've got to think about experimentation when you no longer are in control of updates. And I would say that everything other than web is pretty much on the other side of that divide. Even if you are building mobile apps, auto update is turned on for a certain number of phones, but not all phones, and phones are not always connected to the network. You have to make some worst case assumptions about when it's gonna update. So only, only in web do you have really frictionless access to make changes when you feel like it. Business model, your business model, has another big impact. What do I mean by your business model? How you make money. At one end of the spectrum, you have Trilogy ch charging $50 million to Fortune 500 companies. Then maybe you have um, companies that sell software for the tens of thousands or thousands of dollars. Maybe you are starting to get into consumer range. Maybe Microsoft Office might sell for a couple hundred dollars. Maybe it's Candy Crush, it's freemium, you make a few dollars per user. Maybe you're Facebook, your software is free. It's ad supported. All right, so the more money you charge, more likely the more mission critical you are to your users and customers, and the more they have an expectation that they can depend on your software to be reliable and to be present. And so if your technology stack drives the cost to you of experimentation, how much it costs you to construct and deploy an experiment and learn from it, then the business model, your business model, kind of determines the cost to your customer of you experimenting. If you mess around with the order of somebody's newsfeed, that's probably not super high cost to them if they even notice it at all. If you mess around with the operating system running somebody's data center and their payroll system goes down or their ability to process credit cards, um, you've cost them a lot. Now, I don't want to say that technology and business stack and business model are the only constraints that matter or that they're the only sort of thing that affects your, your product DNA. Um, and, but I'm not going to talk about any of the others. I'll put them up here to acknowledge that they exist and that I know they exist. Is your company in a mode where it is prioritizing growth or is it in a mode where it's prioritizing making profits? Are you trying to, are you getting more of your revenue from new customers versus existing customers? Maybe you're more willing to piss off existing customers if new customers are gone anyway and it's more about how quickly can you acquire them. Um, certainly the caliber of your engineering team drives how costly it is to experiment and how, how much energy you waste. <coughs> So these exist, but I'm just gonna hand wave them. I will leave them as an exercise for the reader. I believe that technology stack and business model are actually by far the most dominant factors. All right, so let's start with an example, with some examples. Let's put these two things into a, a two-dimensional space so we can start to think about this as an axis. And um, I put here the companies that I've worked for and sort of how I think they landed on the technology stack. And you can see that I got most of the way around the circle actually. Um, which is how I formed this hypothesis. Um, and I'll, I'll throw up some other examples just to, that you may also recognize, just to kind of really completely fill this out, right? So in the upper right here, we have sort of cheap or free web-supported software. Bottom right, we have still web software, but we charge money. We are dependent on by our customers. Bottom left, we're still in the enterprise space, but now we're shipping native code, system software. And of course, upper right, there is still free and consumer native code and, and software, although more and more of it is games these days. Um, <coughs> although the renaissance of native mobile apps has really created a resurgence in this zone. All right, so let's maybe do a quick show of hands again to make sure I haven't listed through this too quickly um, and see if you guys can identify yourself on this map. So how many of you would you say you're in the upper right? Not too many, okay. You're lucky, this is a great zone, this is the best zone for experimentation, it is so easy. You have got it so good compared to everybody else. All right, you're in the bottom right. You're on the web stack, but you're selling enterprises. All right, good. You're in the top left, let's mix it up. So system software, native software, but still consumer oriented. Your price point's under a thousand bucks. Okay, that's a lot of you not raising your hands. Bottom left, you're selling native and system software to enterprises. I don't feel like I saw everybody's hands. How many people did not raise their hands? Okay, um, what, who'd I miss? Let me take some examples. Mobile and free. Mobile and free? You're in the upper left. If you're mobile, you are on the left. I'm sorry to tell you. You do not control your destiny and deployment. Um, how about, uh, another example. Uh, consumer uh, is mobile and 
Well, when, uh, lots of people are mixing mobile and web. Um, as, uh, like, you can be Facebook. You can be in the, the upper left and right. Sure. Anybody else who feels like they can't find themselves on this map? Want to give me an example? All right. I mean, there are other business models to be in. By the way, you can be a platform business. You can, you know, you can really be an ecosystem play. But I think even that can be sort of approximated onto here. All right. So let's talk about even just one aspect of your decision making of your priorities that is going to be shaped by what zone you're in. Let's talk about the cost of a mistake. And this is kind of a big deal, not just for sort of creating processes, but it actually kind of drives your culture too. How much appetite you have for risk is, I think, one of the most fundamental things in a company's culture. Um, so, and I think what tends to drive risk, we think about it as a personality of the founder choice, but I think in truth, it is also or even more driven by the environment you're operating in to wit, what is the cost of a mistake? How deadly is a mistake for your business? <clears throat> You few folks in the upper right, the cost of a mistake, like there is a cost, right? There's some cost to your users. They're grumpy because they try to access your site and it's down. Um, or it's, you know, the wrong color or it's the fonts are screwed up. But you're not mission, you're free. They're not paying for you. You're not mission critical. They can go away and come back in 10 minutes. Um, and the cost to you is the cost to fix it, which everybody has some innate cost. We'll call that X, which you have to fix. Um, but then as soon as you fix it, you can deploy it. So that the time you're down or the time you're broken to your users is kind of instantaneous. I mean, if it's a bad bug, you can literally deploy a patch. If not, you know, you can catch it in your next web server role, which is lightweight for you. Okay, so let's say that's like the fundamental baseline minimum cost of a mistake is X and in the upper right corner, your one X. Well, let's move left. What happens when your software is system software? So updating your software requires user intervention. If you're an iOS app, you have to go through the app store and get Apple to approve your hotfix. Um, users notice that users are down until they get the latest update of your app, which can take days. Uh, even on Android without an approval process, there is gonna be some real lag between you pushing your new build and users gradually updating to it. <clears throat> um, users get update fatigue. You cannot count on pushing a new build three times a week, let alone nine times a week, which is how often Facebook refreshes its web servers. So, um, yes, Tuesday afternoons are the big one, but uh, uh, twice, twice every weekday, once on Tuesdays. And so, um, so it's, I think, roughly ballpark accurate to say it is an order of magnitude more expensive to make a mistake with system software where you don't get to update that frequently and updates are under somebody else's control. Let's move down to the bottom right. <clears throat> your sales force, your message one. Something's wrong with your site. Um, you know, if you're on a sales call and Salesforce is down, that's pretty bad for you. It's maybe not life ending, but it's not good. And even if Salesforce controls, quickly fixes it, updates their web servers, the next time I refresh the browser page 10 minutes later, it's better. Like, I still look dumb. You're WebEx. I was trying to do a demo for a customer. I looked bad that WebEx was down. So when you're mission critical, when you're charging people for the software, when they are betting their jobs and their work on you, you're it is a much higher cost. And I would say, again, it is conservative to estimate it is an order of magnitude more expensive to make a mistake when people are counting on your software to get the job done. Let's talk about the bottom left, where a lot of you are located. Um, you know, the crummy thing is that these factors do not sum, they multiply. And so it is roughly two orders of magnitude worse to make a mistake shipping operating systems to, in a data center than it is in a web app. Um, and so the culture of a company who makes data center operating systems is gonna be fundamentally much more conservative about taking risk. That doesn't mean you cannot experiment. It means you need to find ways to experiment that contain those risks. So um, let's take a look at each of these zones. So if top right is zone one, web consumer, where a few of you live, <clears throat> this writing is tiny. Can you guys in back see it? Raise your hand if you can see the writing. All right, the back row is in a little trouble, but I think you're going to get these emailed out, um, and I will try to talk to it. All right, so experimentation is pretty easy in web, on the web, and the impact to users is pretty low, and fixing mistakes is not such a big deal. 
code bloat doesn't so much matter, like you only need to implement each experiment one time, and the code's running on your hardware anyway, so making your code base a little larger with experimental code. You know, you need to devote some time and energy to cleaning up your technical debt, and that will eventually slow down your engineering team, but it's very manageable. And even if things go really south, your worst case scenario is a hotfix, which is, you know, something you can manage. Um, so in this zone, <clears throat> you really can feel comfortable doing what Facebook does, going ahead and A-B testing in production. You may find that that is the cheapest and quickest way to get feedback from users, in fact. Um, and if you are doing a lot of it, or if you're a larger and more mature company, then you can start to really invest. Um, and it is a best practice to invest in your tooling and your technology stack for doing this, giving yourself rich server-side controls, rich visualization, um, realizing, I think, having the breakthrough that experimentation is even on users is even faster than going and asking for their opinions and running UX's study um, was a big breakthrough in speed up um, and can be for you as well. All right, so let's go left. Native code is going to make it hard. Um, it's more work to experiment when you're writing native code because probably if you're running on native code, you also you're not just an iOS app, you're also an Android app. You're not just a Windows app, you're also an OS X app, um, and so. Now, to make an experiment, you've got to make it in multiple code bases. Um, you've got to test it on more than one platform, which you don't control. You probably have to worry about the environment, the operating system, other apps, um, and the setup of the device. Um, this is, again, gets worse the further left you go. Uh, the, the sort of test matrix of mobile devices uh, is not nearly as bad as the test matrix of server hardware that exists in the world. Um, and you're not going to be able to ship those experiments until you're sure they're stable enough not to blow up. So that's, that's a lot more work. Fixing mistakes is much slower. You've got to go through the app store. You've got to go through users. <clears throat> and there is a, the worst case scenario is pretty bad. Your app is actually unusable until users update it. Um, and so the best practices here are actually to try to limit your experimentation to code that runs on the server. And even most native and system software does have, these days, a a client element. And if you must run experiments on the client, they all need to have server controlled kill switches. And that's ideal for apps that are not going to run in offline mode. Um, so you can and should experiment, but you should put a lot more infrastructure and a lot more design and careful thought into the frameworks, the testing frameworks that you're using and the experimentation frameworks that you're using, and really be able to kill your experiment from central command. Um, and if things go cockeyed, if you're assuming that the experiment only runs, your experiment should not run in offline mode because you won't be able to control your experiment from the server. Um, <clears throat> there are other things you can do, and one of the best of them is having a beta program. And what's nice about a beta or a pre-release access program is that, um, is that you get a different set of expectations um, from users, and you can uh, you can have an update channel that is sideband of your production update channel. Um, so that is another very common thing to do with native code. Customers relying on you also makes it harder. As I talked about before, user the user impact of experimentation is very high. They need your software to do their jobs. If you're messing around with it and it goes south in a way that's unexpected, um, you know a worst case scenario is they just walk away from your product because they can't count on it. But there are some, there is one actual real benefit of charging customers a lot of money for software. I mean, a benefit besides revenue. And that is that um, your customers, you can start to build intimate relationships with them. And they have a vested interest in your software getting better in ways that make it work better for them. And so you can actually get design input from them just by sitting and talking to them. And you can, and, 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 and they are more than willing, rather than passively running experiments, most big customers are more than willing to pilot or to run test programs or to run alpha programs and give you a lot of feedback. And so that can be a way to run experiments explicitly and with the cooperation of your customers and to get much more sort of direct feedback. It still requires interpretation, but much more direct feedback than just sort of sitting behind a glass window and observing the behavior of users in the wild based on their, their clicks and actions on your site. Um, Beta programs are also an immense advantage um, in this world because when a user downloads a beta <clears throat> or signs up for a beta of your software, it turns their, expect their expectations to a 180. Even if it's software that they pay a lot of money for, <clears throat> which 
It would ordinarily infuriate them to run into bugs or weird experiments. When they conceive of themselves as beta testing, when they are trying to give you feedback and they get the benefit that they are shaping the direction of your software or, or otherwise partnering with you, the interesting thing is, even though beta users are getting a buggier, wonkier, stranger version of your software, invariably, when you run a beta program, your users actually become more intensely happy and loyal to you. And it's not just a selection bias that the loyal users are the ones who join your beta program. Users actually become more loyal over the time that they participate in a beta. So, so there's really no lose. Beta programs are win-win um, because users identify themselves as trying to be helpful to you. And that makes you seem smarter and more good looking. <laughs> and just the fact that you want their feedback and you're listening to them and paying attention to them just makes you a better better. So this is a very positive way to shape expectations when you do experimentation. Now, um, there is a downside to a beta program for experimentation. It can find bugs, but beta users are very unlikely to be representative of your user base as a whole. Especially if you're, it's maybe not such a big deal if you're in a lower volume of customers, enterprise business. But in the consumer world, you know, if you're Facebook and you're trying to figure out if um, making a message send when I hit the enter key instead of making me click a, an explicit send button and having enter given, so this is something we experimented with. When you type a message in Facebook Messenger um, on your desk, on, on desktop, on the web, um, when I hit the enter key, does it automatically send the message or does it send a new line and I have to press a button? All right, that was something we wanted to experiment with to see the volume of messages. And, you know, if we ran that on an unrepresentative sample of users, we could get the wrong answer. We really needed volume and we needed representation and we needed diversity of users to get the right answer in that experiment. Um, so that kind of experimentation, uh, you are not gonna get from a beta program. Um, and you're gonna have to do your best to approximate it with user feedback, which is where customer input comes in. Last but not least, if you are in the world where you have both costs working against you, you have customers relying on you and you have native code, what you can do and what ended up being pivotal, a, a critical win for VMware, was actually to create and launch and maintain a free version of our software strictly as an experimentation channel. How many of you have ever heard of or used VMware Workstation? All right, yes, you are developers, you are its target market, all right. VMware Workstation is not a profitable product for VMware. The cost, the, the revenue it brings in is less than the cost of development. And um, in fact, there's free versions of Workstation called Player, which are obviously not profit making. Um, and yet, VMware continues to invest in Workstation and will. And the reason is <coughs> that Workstation, um, if you're not familiar with it, it is, a, uh, it is a form of VMware's core virtualization platform that runs on top of a Windows or a Linux box and creates VMs in, those, in that environment where it's hosted instead of being a, a bare metal operating system like VMware server products. Um, and it's used frequently by developers and testers. And what's great about the Workstation product is because from a cost to customers perspective, because the users are developers and testers, and because their expectations are different when they're paying 100 bucks or it's free um, than when they're paying tens of thousands or millions of dollars to run something in a data center, and it's a tool instead of an operating system, um, it is possible for VMware to ship really, um, innovative and technically risky features in Workstation first and have it really shaken down by a set of users who are technically extremely savvy and report very good bugs and exercise the software in actually extremely difficult ways. They're not necessarily getting the massive scale of a production data center, but lots of the bugs that manifest in VMware Workstation or in VMware's hypervisor are much less about scale and load, and those things are easy to simulate in the QA lab anyway, and they're much more about uh, the diversity of the environments that the hypervisor is going to run into, and the diversity of app, apps that run inside. And so, um, when we're doing something really technically risky, it usually ships in workstation a year ahead. Um, and that means that by the time a new hypervisor feature lands in your data center, it's actually been operating in the wild with developers and QA engineers sending bug reports to VMware for 12 to 18 months, counting the beta period for those products. Um, and so it can be really rock solid and stable. 
Now, it may sound like ridiculously costly to have a whole separate version of your product, which is free, um, in order to get an experimentation channel, in order to get user <laughs> feedback. Um, but if you are a successful enough product, if you have high enough momentum, and if like VMware, you're trying to do things that are really technically risky, is absolutely worth it. Um, so let's sort of put it all together and come back to the, the map. These are, I don't want to say this is what you have to do, or this is what you're supposed to do. Um, but if you have found the quadrant you're in, these are some typical choices you might make. These are some things that may work out for you that are some good starting points. Whether that's production A-B testing, whether that's using A-B testing to drive design and the movement of metrics, which really makes sense to do when you can experiment continuously, makes much less sense when you're on the native side, but you can still, in a volume customer business, need to be very metrics driven in your business, which again makes less sense on the enterprise side. So I don't want to try to sort of, this would be four different talks if I was trying to give you the exhaustive version of what to do in each zone. But I hope that in scratching the surface this way, I'm sort of putting you on the track of figuring out which um, methodologies may work for you. And there's also, I would say, a few more takeaways I want you to have from this. First of all, experimentation is absolutely possible in every quadrant. It's not only possible in the upper right, it is absolutely possible in the bottom left. Second, but you need to respect the constraints of the environment you're in. VMware cannot get away with putting 50 experiments in every release. VMware could not get away with designing its product via experimentation, and searching the design space by experiment. Um, but they can get away with doing that for risky technology features because of the free product lines or the cheap product lines. Um, third, when you bring someone new into your organization, when you hire a leader for your technical team or a product manager, maybe get someone from the same zone. Or if you get someone from a different zone, realize that you're going to have to sort of re-educate them. Because people do have a way of coming to believe that, you know, I have come to learn the best way to experiment. I have learned the best way to ship software. Trust me, you know, I did it for seven years at VMware. Facebook, let me tell you how to ship software. Uh-uh. I have to relearn how to ship software in the Facebook environment from the way VMware did it. And when you bring new hires in, you've got to do that too. Um, and, and recognize that you're not just teaching people new processes or new technologies, you're teaching them new priorities and new values. And last and maybe hardest to sort of internalize is, and, and most of you are at smaller companies, um, but you're probably getting to the stage where you're forking into multiple product lines. And more and more, especially on the consumer side, companies are having to um, balance both a web and a mobile product offering. And I think that web and mobile are pretty different. And as a result, those teams are going to need to operate in different ways and experiment in different ways. And they need to respect each other's differences. Um, and, and it needs to be OK. Very often what happens at a company is that the first product line kind of sets the software culture and the company culture. and then. For the rest of time, all the products that that company evolves kind of end up marching down that path. I've never worked at Microsoft. I've interviewed a lot of engineers coming out of Microsoft, and um, especially a lot of engineers from Bing. And one impression that I indelibly formed, and does anybody here from Microsoft or Bing? I'm not going to throw Microsoft under the bus, but I think I have immense respect for Microsoft that they, they have, enormous, have enjoyed enormous success and created a lot of value in the world. But if I look at Bing, and I look at the way that Bing operates, I think that they do not take nearly as much advantage of being web-based free software as they could. And that is because the Microsoft's DNA, its culture, its roots, are all here on the bottom left, right? Operating systems for servers, and operating systems for desktops, right? It's on the left-hand side. And so even though they understand that it's the web, even though they understand that they could update twice a day, a true culture of experimentation and constant update, they're not taking full advantage of how the constraints of the system has changed. 
Because if you're at Microsoft, your whole value system of what it means to be a good engineer is someone who can come up with a predictable deadline and hit it, as opposed to someone who can necessarily sort of have a lot of high through, like you want to plan everything out in advance. In a world, you don't have to plan everything out in advance. Um, and, that's, um, and that's a missed opportunity, I think, for Microsoft. So if you exist in a company that has more than one product line, and your product lines exist in different quadrants, <coughs> there's an enormous opportunity for you to be more effective if you can recognize and respect different product teams having different cultures and different approaches and different practices to experimentation. But that turns out to be hard because we get religious about the way we make software and the way we take risks and the way we experiment. And instead of thinking, hey, this is a process that works in this situation, we think, I have discovered natural law. I have discovered the laws of physics. And you are an idiot who is trying to break the laws of physics. Well, if the, if, the, if the rules that govern experimentation and software release process, if they are like any law of physics at all, they are more like the law of gravity, which is to say the gravitational constant, the law of gravity is fixed, but the gravitational constant is different on every planet. And so if you see someone, you know, the, 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 the propulsion engines that work on Earth are going to be very different from the ones you want on the moon, and they're going to be different from the ones you want on Mars. And so um, there is a real value in having teams respect one another and respect that they have different gravitational constants. Um, and I saw this play out, and I think probably the most um, poignant example in my long career was Facebook's transition to mobile, which I think notoriously <laughs> took years, came late, was, vi was obviously something the company needed to do, and yet it was extremely difficult. And <clears throat> you'll find many Facebook employees who will talk about it in different ways and will talk about why it was hard. Certainly it's well known that Facebook started out approaching mobile trying to deliver on the web, trying to deliver HTML5 because they put their culture of experimentation and their way of delivering software first and the needs of, and, and hoped that they could deliver valuable enough user experience without going native. And when they finally recognized that they had to build native apps, um, I do not think it's an exaggeration to say that that pivot was difficult for Facebook, not because Objective-C is a difficult language for PHP developers to learn, not because those two languages are particularly far apart, um, but rather because of, I think, the change in software release process and philosophy, which led to, frankly, a lot of culture war within the company. The developers who came from the web product side and the developers who came from the native mobile side did not just have differing opinions about how to ship software, did not just think the opposite number was incorrect. They thought the other party was guilty of bad taste, bad ethics, and was an existential threat to the identity and mission of the company. Uh, so, so this was not a pretty scene. Um, and to sort of give you a specific example of how it played out, the way a web product team at Facebook designed a new feature was intrinsically iterative. They would take about a week to develop a prototype of the feature, they would launch a test, they would get some feedback, they would incorporate that feedback into their prototype, and then they would expose that to users again and see the results. All right, so from my idea to seeing the results of my test and absorbing them and seeing how those changes worked, that feedback loop, total of two weeks. And so it was literally the way a new product gets designed at Facebook on the web is it's three months of these one week cycles of experimenting and designing and you know how many of those cycles you do actually, three months is a made up number, you can do anywhere from, depending on the complexity of the feature, you can do anywhere from five to 20 of these iteration cycles, but eventually you land on something with good metrics and then you productize it and then you ship it and then you keep fixing it until it really works. And so this was, um, if you applied that product development philosophy to mobile at Facebook, the native mobile apps at Facebook had a release train, which not only was a four week train, but was really an eight week train. There were four weeks of development and four weeks of stabilization post feature freeze. And these were pipelines so that every four weeks something ships. But if you ship an experiment in a release, you're already past the feature freeze date of the next release. So if you learn something from your experiment and you want to make a change and learn that, you're really going to get into the next one that's eight weeks away. So that two-week product iteration cycle on web 
becomes a 16-week product iteration cycle on mobile. And the product teams were like, this is god awful. If I was going to ship a product in a year, now I'm going to ship it in four years, like, that's nonsense. <laughs> if I can't ship it in a year, I can't ship it at all. Um, and it is nonsense. Um, you mobile people are idiots. <clears throat> You're like, clearly this feature freeze is crazy, and this four week cycle is crazy. It needs to be every week, and there needs to be no freeze, and you know. Um, meanwhile, the mobile team is just sort of, who come from the upper left side, are uh, absolutely appalled at any product development philosophy that is trying to experiment their way to a design anyway. As far as they're concerned, you design a product, you build it, you stabilize it, you ship it, done, and sort it. Um, and, and you people are deviants. For, for trying to do it your way. Um, and so this was a hard nut to crack. And, uh, <coughs> and but there was a solution. Um, and does it, I don't know if any of you are, have, have tried to start on web and pivot to, to mobile or built up separate mobile team, web and mobile teams. Is any of this ringing a bell? Yeah. Maybe a little? Yeah. All right. I'm using strong language. I won't ask you to identify with considering your coworkers to be deviant. Um, so there were solutions, all right? So which started with, we actually had to trust and respect each other and listen to each other um, and give one another the benefit of the doubt. Uh, that was probably the hardest part, to be honest. Um, and those conversations were facilitated by finding a common ground. And the common ground was everybody wanted to do right by the user. Everybody wanted the people using Facebook to get the best possible experience. And so we could agree on that if we could agree on nothing else. And so then we were arguing about implementation. How do we accomplish that? And when we put it in those terms, the product teams could see that constant experimentation in the native app wasn't great for users. And so they could also see that, hey, if I want feedback on my design, it is actually faster to get it from a UX study now. It's not true on the web. It's still the case on web that running an A-B test is a faster way to get feedback than running a UX study. Maybe some of both. But they're doing a lot more UX studies now on the native code because that is actually a faster and shorter design feedback loop. Um, we also launched a beta program, and that ended up being a very effective channel for getting bugs and sort of a ballpark idea of metrics impact. So there was compromise from the web team on what they were looking for. We also sped up the release cycles and moved to every two weeks instead of every four weeks. Um, and a bunch of the product teams who really want to go fast or who really don't want to deal with the feature freeze are disaggregating into their own standalone apps where they can kind of make their own rules because they're not going to screw any other product team um, by introducing a late risky change. Um, so, so collectively, we managed to find a way where, yes, we really did have to change. We could not ship software on mobile the same way we did on web. But we found ways to ship software on mobile that were still faithful to Facebook's culture and spirit of experimentation um, and spirit of iterative product design. Um, and, and Facebook still does not make mobile apps the same way that Apple or Google does. Um, they do it in a Facebook way. So it's absolutely possible to do that um, and find a way that is faithful to your own company. You don't have to follow somebody else's blueprint. Um, but you can't blindly apply what you did in another zone. Um, Anyway, I see your question pulled it. I think I'm, I think I'm at the end. So I guess my sort of final summation would be, um, you know, no matter who you are with the challenges, please believe me that you can experiment. But also take your advice on how to experiment from people who have walked a mile in shoes that resemble yours, and or, or on a planet whose gravitational constant is the same. Um, and with that, I'd love to take questions. So I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, what, what did you end up doing with the uh, backend API? Did you have to split them for web and mobile? Yes. Last year. Um, did Facebook have to split backend APIs for web and mobile? No. We used the same APIs for both. So which clock did you put the APIs on? Oh, the server moves all the time. The server moves all the time. Because the server, even though it is the back end of the mobile app, it's still kind of, your server side is, from a, from a technology stack perspective, your server side resembles the web stack. You can update it whenever you like. Um, and Facebook's business model did not change. So we still weren't incurring high cost to customers of changing.